how to bring in more chairs for people. <laughs> so, um, so I started in this birth community about seven years ago, and our first expo was like eight tables. <laughs> it was really tiny, so it's really exciting to see such a busy expo today and so many new faces. So thanks for coming. I'm going to start out um, just explaining for those of you guys who don't know who I am. Um, I am first and foremost a mom. I have a seven and a half year old daughter. Um, she is the reason that I started down my path into her work. I'm a Florida licensed midwife, a certified professional midwife. I'm also a certified lactation counselor. Um, and as a licensed midwife, we keep current with neonatal resuscitation and CPR. Um, so those are kind of my credentials. Um, what I do is provide prenatal care, I obviously work as a home birth midwife. I do have moms who get prenatal care with me. Our bus is outside, um, which will be open this afternoon. So I do have some moms who get prenatal care with me and then still deliver in the hospital with on-call physicians. Um, but I do home births as well. I work at the Florida School of Traditional Midwifery as a staff uh, faculty member um, and teach new little baby midwives, um, which has been really exciting. Midwifery is really, really growing. So there's lots of new uh, midwives in the community. Um, and I'm also a recently appointed member of the Council of Licensed Midwifery here in Florida. So I have a lot of passion about midwifery and specifically about home birth, um, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So first, I just want everyone to consider the statistics nationwide. So in America, we have about a 33% cesarean rate. That's the most recent data that was published by the CDC um, in 2012. Um, there was some speculation that last year might be the first year that it's gone down. Um, and I think that was only about half a percent. So we're not doing very well as far as that's concerned. Um, one in three women, approximately, will end up with needing major abdominal surgery to have their babies. Um, we also have really terrible infant mortality and morbidity rates, as well as maternal mortality rates. Um, we're ranked really low behind nations like Finland and other industrialized countries in Europe. Um, so we're not doing too hot as far as that's concerned, um, which considering our technology um, and the potential that we could have here in America doesn't look so good. Um, and we're one of the only industrialized country that, that countries that uses obstetricians as our primary care for pregnancy. And I think getting into this discussion, what we need to remember is that obstetricians are surgeons. It's a surgical specialty. So if we're planning to give birth and we want to give birth naturally, maybe we shouldn't hire a surgeon to take care of us. So something to consider. Um, other, other countries that I could kind of put us side by side with, like England, the Netherlands, their primary care providers for pregnancy are midwives. They specialize in normal. Only if there's a complication or if mom is high risk or there's something with baby are you escalated to the care of a specialist. So that's a, that's a really important to, a point to consider when we're talking about midwifery and home birth and out of hospital birth as well. So with home birth, I feel like our uh, first stereotype that comes to mind is um, kind of this picture was the perfect, <laughs> perfect thought um, to have about home birth. Um, and I can say for sure when I was pregnant with my daughter, we didn't even know people still had home births. And here I am sitting here talking to you about what home birth looks like. Um, and all of this information is, is in this infographic, which some of them have been passed around and they'll be by the door on the way out if you um, want to look back. So considering the history of home birth, um, less than 5% of women were giving birth in the hospital at the turn of the century. Um, birth really didn't start to move into the hospitals in America until the late 1930s. Uh, and 1940s. So still at that point, um, only only close to half of women gave birth in the hospital. Everybody had their babies at home. Some with midwives, some with um, what we call like granny or lay midwives in rural areas, um, and a lot with community doctors. My grandmother was born at home. There was a doctor that served the little area out in the middle of nowhere near Plant City and they, he, deal, he dealt with everything. So birth, sickness, death, it was, you just called the doctor and he came over. Very similar to what we do as midwives now in the community. Um, 
there was a very large home birth movement, which the previous picture I think kind of dates back to that in this in the late 60s and 70s to kind of take control over births and get them back at home. So that kind of like hippie grassroots movement. Um, Ina Mae Gaskin on the farm, I'm sure many of you maybe know about her and what they have done in Tennessee. That was part of that large movement to kind of like, we're going to do this ourselves, we're going to have our babies, we're not going to the hospital. And then through 2004, after that movement, less than 1% or less than 2%, depending on what part of the country, a birth took place at home. So a very, very small number of outlying people chose to have their babies at home for whatever reason. Now, it's exciting to say that from 2004 until present day, we don't have a, a current number just yet, but there's approximately seven to nine percent of people choosing to deliver outside of the hospital. So a huge leap since 2004. So with that, with that kind of exponential increase, we have way more midwives. Even today at the expo, you can see there are several of us home birth midwives, there's several birth centers. So people are starting to realize that maybe they don't want to go to the hospital if they don't have to be there to have their babies, and that's really exciting. So we're going to break down some of the misconceptions. The first that I hear all the time is that only hippies have home births. I think people have a generalized stereotype when they think about home births if they don't know anyone who's had a home birth. It's somebody that you know lives on the commune, and their midwife is going to come, and she's going to have a drum, and they're going to have their baby, and it's going to be kind of ridiculous. So the reality is, though, that lots of people have home births. I've taken care of doctors, NICU nurses, labor and delivery nurses. I mean, what does that tell you about you know those providers wanting to deliver their babies at home? Um, really normal people, every color, every race. Um, all sorts of different socioeconomic levels. It's really exciting. In Florida, we're able to build private insurance and we're also able to accept Medicaid. So it really opens up the doors for women to have that option. It's not just upper middle class white women who can choose to pay out of pocket and have a home birth. Um, big families, small families, we have um, moms who have 12 babies all the way down to moms who are having their first baby. Um, Families can choose to have their, their large families present. They can choose to have anybody there that they want to have theirs, which isn't an option for a lot of families in the hospital. Um, so sometimes that leads to their decision. And probably if you talk to your family, your great grandmother, a great aunt, somebody may have delivered at home that you didn't know about because it just wasn't popular to go to the hospital um, mid-century, which is kind of cool. Something that I certainly didn't think about or know. The other misconception that we are, uh, as midwives, that we are witch doctors, sorcerers, we bring nothing besides essential oils and incense to your birth, we're not professionals, we can just crown ourselves as midwives. Um, the reality is that we're all pretty normal. We're pretty normal people. I'm a normal mom, I have a normal child who goes to public school. Um, we see we see families of all different kinds, um, and we have to, as midwives, we have to have a way to relate to that. So while there may be some midwives who fit that description of you know like witch clothes and a drum, a lot of us um, are kind of on the other, more normal side of things where most people live. So um, we also have uh, a lot of equipment that we bring with us. That's one of the number one questions that I get. What's your training and what do you bring with you? Um, and I actually brought my actual birth bag um, to kind of touch more on that uh, topic, which afterwards anyone is welcome to come by and have a look if you'd like to. Um, as licensed midwives in the state of Florida, which there are licensed midwives who attend home births and there are also certified nurse midwives um, throughout the state. There's just a handful of nurse midwives though who attend out of hospital births. But as licensed midwives, our law, our protocol is written into our law with the state, and they kind of lay out what we, the guidelines that we have to follow, the medications that we have to carry with us, what type of resuscitation equipment. So up here, I have everything from resuscitation equipment for baby, resuscitation equipment for mom, 
We carry oxygen, everything to do um, sutures. If mom were to have a tear, we're able to do that repair with lidocaine. You don't have to take a shot of whiskey. You don't have to chew on a stick. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many moms are like, okay, I need to have stitches. Like, I can do this. I push my baby out. And it's like, wait a second, we are going to numb you up. You don't have to sit through stitches with, <laughs> without being numbed. We're able to do, um, we're able to cath moms if we need to. So if mom is having a hard time in labor and needs to be cathed or postpartum, if she can't uh, urinate on her own, we're able to cath. Um, we can start IVs. Um, we can do any suctioning that needs to happen for baby. We do a full newborn exam. We offer you the same things that they offer in the hospital for baby. Uh, head to toe exam, vitamin K, eye ointment. We do the newborn screening when we come back to see moms at their 24 to 48 hour visit. Um, we have everything for IV, so if mom is GBS positive, we can run antibiotics in labor. Are you required to do those, or is that an option? Everything is an option. That's the other beauty of home birth. So we offer all of those things, but families have the, the kind of free range to decide, yes, I want that, no, I don't. So always an option. Um, and then we have everything for IVs in case of an emergency um, and all sorts of little other things to help take care of mom if needed. Um, we also can carry Pitocin, Methogen, and Cytotec, which are all drugs that we use to um, manage postpartum hemorrhage. So a lot of concern I think people have with, well, what happens if something goes wrong? We have everything to kind of be a good Girl Scout and stabilize mom and baby so we can get them to the hospital if we need to. Um, some things, I like to be very straightforward with people about what can happen at a home birth. It's a lot of the same risk that can happen in the hospital. There's always a risk of a cord prolapse, a shoulder dystocia, a postpartum hemorrhage. These are all things that we are trained in to stabilize mom and baby and get you to the hospital if need be. Um, so you guys are welcome to take a look. We also use um, electronic medical charting, which is really nice. We're able to, to keep up with mom and labor with our electronic system and chart all of the vitals and have it all there in one place. Um, which is what we're moving more towards in the medical community of no longer doing paper charting. So it's not like we have a chisel and a stone to put everything into. The misconception number three is that camping birth at home is really dangerous. So I touched a little bit on some of the things that we do to make home birth safe. Um, and the reality is we have some great studies on home birth and our outcomes. My favorite is actual birth certificate data. As Florida licensed midwives, like I'm gonna boast for a second, we're awesome. We have really great outcomes. We have really um, across the state. So there's about 320 licensed midwives now, maybe a little bit more. Um, I'm looking at Hattie, who is recently Three licensed. <laughs> recently licensed. So what's your license number, Hattie? 307. 307. So we have a little bit over 300 licensed midwives. So, um, which, you know, across the state, we need more, but it's exciting because just a few years ago, we only had like 150. Um, so uh, when you pull vital statistic data, that's reality. That's what's actually happened in whatever year you're choosing to look at it. And those outcomes are really, really great in this state. Um, we also have national studies. There was a Cochrane review in 2006. We have MANA statistics. We also have an NIH study. So there's a lot of research that you can look at regarding home birth specifically. And we're talking about planned home births, which is something that our birth certificates specify here in this state. Um, we're not talking about people who, oops, had their baby on the side of the road, or women who may be transient and, oops, didn't know they were pregnant and had their baby in an alley somewhere. Some, those used to be included in the, in the home birth data, so it really skewed the research for a little bit. Now we, we can say specifically on the birth certificate, this person had a home birth and it was planned and it went really well. Um, so we have all of that. And, and what they found through our MANA statistics, um, which were midwives, certified professional midwives across the U.S. submitted their data, and the MANA statistics published all of that for the public. Um, it's a little bit hard because it includes things that we don't do here in the state, like breach and twin deliveries, but overall what they found, um, and also what the NIH has said, is that low-risk women who plan home births not only have the same 
um, have about the same outcomes as women, lower women who plan hospital births, they have the benefit of less intervention. So for women who are wanting to deliver without drugs, who want to kind of have things on their own accord, um, you have the same risk in the hospital for a bad outcome as you do at home. So that's pretty, that's some pretty great information when considering your options. The misconception number four. This I hear a lot from dads. Isn't it messy? Who's going to clean up the mess? Um, I've had lots of, lots of families over the years who tell us, My, our house is cleaner when you left than when you got here. So we make it a big deal. We carry the little puppy pads, Chuck's pads. We follow families around while mom is laboring. Um, we scrub carpets. We make sure everything looks like it did when we got there before we leave. We, our assistants do your laundry, we do your dishes. Um, so we, we take a lot of extra care and precaution to be sure that your house is left the same as when we got there. Um, it's really not much of a Dexter scene for the most part. Yeah. Um, did you say you don't do breach? We do not attend breach births um, outside of the hospital in Florida as licensed midwives. No. And that's um, item A is training the obstetrician. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, with with um, malpractice and, and litigation, it's very difficult to find an obstetrician who will do a vaginal breach delivery. We have a couple that will consider it in the state. Um, as far as licensed midwives, our law says that we have to have a physician who will sign off on or a consult for a breach delivery, there's nobody who's going to consult with a licensed midwife to do a breach birth at home here. There are several other states where midwives attend breach births all the time and they have great outcomes. It's just there is some elevated risk with a breach delivery that when we're not trained and seeing those regularly, you want to have the extra you know, safety of being in the hospital. Um, we also don't attend twins. So if somebody finds out they're having twins, we have to refer them out. So I asked some of my home birth moms when they were considering home birth, what did they really want to know or what did they want other moms to know about midwifery care um, and about home birth. And I think that anecdotal evidence is a really big thing when we're making decisions about parenthood and what we want to do with our births. Um, something that one mom mentioned was that they were home. They didn't need to go elsewhere. They didn't, she didn't need to send her husband back and forth to get things that they had left at the house. Um, they were in their own space. Um, and they got to do whatever they want. She got to move where she wanted to, to move. She got to eat what she wanted to eat. She could get in the tub, get in the shower. She was able to, to labor how she wanted to labor, which with her first birth, she didn't feel she had those options. Um, another, another thing that a mom um, mentioned, uh, and this might be somebody that is in this room, um, <laughs> um, was that she didn't have to have vaginal exams during labor. Going back to do moms have the option uh, to not have medications or not have vaginal exams, um, moms can decide. Do you want to have a cervical check? No? Okay, great. Keep doing your thing. We can revisit it later if, we're not, if we don't have a baby by then. We don't routinely check women before they start pushing, in my practice anyways. Um, we have kind of a, a hands-off approach that like, if everything's going well, it should go well and we shouldn't be intervening on that process. Um, so that was a really important thing, and especially for women who may be like, um, sexual abuse survivors, it's really uncomfortable to be in a hospital setting and have many people in your room and someone just says, okay, now I'm going to put my hands in your vagina and this is just what we do. That can be a very uncomfortable situation. Um, I'll never forget when I, I had my daughter in the hospital and when I um, was about to push, suddenly there were like eight people that I had not seen at all in my room. Um, so, and I always tell my home birth moms, there shouldn't be anyone at your birth that you're not comfortable with having in your vagina. Um, so, and you know, everything in the hospital, when you don't know those people, that is going against that kind of protective mammalian um, intuition that we have as women in labor. So, um, people, this, this mom in particular also said that um, she felt like she could really be in her kind of primal space. And so, touching on that mammalian side, like birth is a very primal thing to do. 
Um, if you don't have privacy and you don't feel comfortable, then there you're not going to be able to push your baby out. You need to go into that like mama kitty space um, and have your babies, just like cats or dogs go and hide. They have their babies and then you find them the next day. It's the same kind of thing. <laughs> Another one. Um, it's kind of touching on the personal relationship that we that that we as midwives have with our clients. So I do exclusively home visits for my clients, or I see moms on our bus. They only see me. I have a backup midwife um, who's based in Lakeland. In case of an emergency, she covers for me. Um, or if two moms happen to be in labor at the same time. Um, but I know my families. I know their whole family. I know what they're worried about. I know what they're looking forward to. I know what. Um, what their other kids are into, and if they're gonna be at the birth, including them. So it's really personalized care. Um, so for women to not feel like they're just in and out, you don't know who you're gonna see, where they have their own like rules and laws that they have to follow, and you're on their clock, and you have to follow their rules. At home, we have our rules as a licensed midwife, but it's your house, we're on your turf, we're in your space, so you get to decide what you want and don't want. Any questions? I'm trying to leave some time for questions here at the end. Touch, touch on anything. Anybody, anything anyone want to add about your home birth or not home birth? <laughs> yep. What's your rate of transfer? I have um, all of my statistics. Uh, I, I pass some of these cards around, but all of my statistics are on the back of the card um, or the front of the card, whichever side you're looking at. Um, I have about a 16% transfer rate. That's the national standard according to MANA statistics as well. It's very close. Um, and that includes both, pre both prenatal, in labor, and um, postpartum transfers. So about 16%. Um, the, there was a study that the AABC did on birth centers. Um, and birth centers have a little bit of a higher com total transfer rate, so at about 30% compared to home birth. So, and, and I don't sit around on, on things. If we notice that there's a problem that's coming up in labor or something doesn't seem just right and it's not resolving, I'm not sitting around on that. We, the hospital is there for a reason, and if we need the hospital, then we will go. So, yeah. If you do have to transfer to the hospital, what is your role? What becomes your role at that point? Well, it really depends on the, on the reason for transfer. A lot of those labor transfers are usually from prolonged labor and maternal exhaustion. So usually, I take care of a large number of VBAC moms and first time moms. There's something so exciting about being in labor finally for a first time mom that a lot of times they don't wanna sleep. So a first labor is usually gonna be a lot longer than any subsequent labor. So what ends up happening is early labor starts, which can go on for 12, 24 hours, and mom stays awake. Um, so then we end up transferring just because she's like, I'm tired by the time early labor kicks in and maybe now she wants an epidural. So in that kind of circumstance, a lot of times I send records, call and give report, make sure they get to the hospital, and then I leave at that point. If there's some kind of emergency, um, if it's an emergent transfer or if it's a postpartum transfer, let's say mom has a third or fourth degree tear that's a surgical repair, then I do the same thing, call, give reports, send the records over, and then I kind of assume the role as a doula at that point. Um, luckily, because license number three is legal in the state, there's no like dumping you off at the hospital. So. Exclusively home visits for my self-pay clients. Um, we have an easy access clinic where we see women who cannot afford our normal self-pay fee or who are on Medicaid. Um, so we will not turn anyone away for prenatal care for <coughs> us, um, and then everybody else we see at home. That was a really important thing for me. I worked at two different birth centers and with several home birth midwives when I was training. And the home visit aspect was a really important thing to me because that's kind of one of those like groovy old school midwife kind of things that we didn't have in this community for the, for the most part. So I wanted to kind of preserve that for families. It's really nice for people to just roll out of bed and exist in their own house and me show up to see them. So, yeah. so you're 
you're good with a couple days of labor? It depends. It depends. So we do have, we have our protocol as written into our law. So our law kind of gives us a general outline of, of things that we have to follow. A couple days of labor, if it is prodromal, early, fine, great. If mom and baby are good, I'm fine with sticking with mom as long as she's fine with staying home and as long as everything is okay. The longest I've ever been with someone was 56 hours. So, so yeah, as long as everything's okay and mom wants to wait it out, then we'll wait it out. You should charge double. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure my husband would love that <laughs> answer. Experience with obstetricians, like attitude, specifically towards the way that that home birth is tra transferred to the hospital. Are they sure? So I um, like it's about a woman choosing. Yeah, yeah. So I've certainly had a mixed response over the years, um, but I've made myself really great at butt kissing. So I'm not be I'm not above that at all. Um, and I have two consulting practices that I use that if a mom has certain risk factors and she needs to be seen by an obstetrician to determine whether or not she's a good candidate for home birth. Um, so I have good consulting relationships with these two practices and I think a lot of times it has more to do with the fact that we show up as midwives and that we're nice. You know, you always catch more flies with honey. So I haven't run into a lot of issues. Sometimes um, residents, I find, can be a little bit snitty about things, but then when they see our charts, they know that we're, oh, this is a person who is providing real prenatal care, they've run labs, they've had an ultrasound. I think they might have a little bit of a misconception sometimes, too. They see LM and think we're a lay midwife and think that we have just, you know, crowned ourselves as a midwife and encouraged people to have home births. But when they see our records, it's like, oh, okay, there's a, there's a little bit more respect there. Um, and I also have worked really, really, really hard, specifically in Tampa, with keeping a good relationship with those consulting doctors. And if I have to send someone, like our VBAC moms, we send them to have a consultation um, with the USS group is who I use specifically. For the most part, they're really great to clients. If they're not really great, um, or, I mean, if they, regardless, they're gonna see them, I send them a thank you letter. So after my mom has her baby, I send them a thank you letter, and if my if that mom has told me like, oh, so and so wasn't so nice, I just casually mention in their letter, hey, this is Charlie Young. I wanted to thank you so much for just giving us your expertise and letting you know, giving giving this client you know your opinion on everything. I just want to let you know she had an awesome home birth. So and just hey, as a reminder, um, we're Florida licensed. Here's the statute you know, treat my clients nicely <laughs> kind of thing. Um, or really just a genuine thank you or if there's a special circumstance mentioning that. So that way there's always that good kind of time and reason. So I feel like that makes a difference. Certainly I've heard from other midwives in other parts of the state who have more um, kind of abrasive communities. It's not the same, but we're really, really lucky for the most part. I mean, a lot of women choose to birth at home because they have some kind of phobia, either of hospitals or needles, or they just suffer from anxiety in general. Um, if a mom is medicated, we do send you to see one of our consulting doctors, just to be sure that you're on the right dose of medication, that you are being treated for that appropriately. Because we just focus on your pregnancy and birth. We want to make sure that your care is balanced and that you're being taken care of appropriately. Somebody, yeah. What's the difference between um, your certification or licensure and the other midwives that nurse are midwives. nurse midwives? Sure. So I'm going to um, backpedal from that question for a second and say that I had um, I had a nurse midwife who took care of me for my pregnancy, and I delivered in the hospital. I did not know people had home births. I didn't know it was an option. So I was planning my natural birth in the hospital with my nurse midwife. Um, nurse midwives have to work under an obstetrician. Their protocol has to be signed off on by an OB. So there's no autonomy there. Hospital
possibly they're working towards having autonomy in the next couple of years. The CNN credential is changing a little bit. Um, but they're nurses before first becoming, or they're first nurses before becoming midwives. So it's a little bit more of a medicalized model of care. Um, they go through and they become, a, they get a BSN, a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, and then they get a specialty in midwifery. In Florida, a licensed midwife, we first go through a didactic program that's three years plus an additional year of prerequisites. We have to pass a board exam and then we can apply for licensure. Um, there's also a, a congruent with that didactic four years almost as a um, apprenticeship. So it's much more hands-on and focused on birth alone versus nurse midwifery is kind of women's care as a whole. So it's a little bit broader, and it's more under the medical model. Licensed midwives, we, um, as far as the state of Florida is concerned, we're kind of with the doctors of oriental medicine, the acupuncturists, the chiropractors. We're on the other side of that. We're not, we're not managed by the Board of Nursing. Anything else? I don't know what the time is. Okay. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, pros to monitor acceleration? Yeah, so we bring, uh, we have these handheld Dopplers. Mm -hmm. So in the hospital, a lot of times you see these on um, belts, like moms have continuous monitoring. And one of those is to listen to baby's heartbeat, and the other one is to monitor contractions. So we actually touch you to monitor contractions and see how strong they are or based on how mom is reacting in labor. And then we listen for a certain amount of time with the handheld Doppler. So, um, and our, our law actually has guidelines for how frequently we have to listen depending on which part of labor you're in. So. Any Do you have like a standard of time for VBAC moms in labor? Like, it's, I know the hospital has like their clock, mm -hmm. but is there like a, a point in time where you're like, okay, well it's been a long time and you're not going anywhere. It really depends on how mom's feeling. As far as our law is concerned, we don't differentiate VBAC. As long as we've had a consultation and mom and baby are healthy and we have kind of the go-ahead for VBAC, then we just consider you under our normal guidelines. So, um, so those are 18 or 24 hours with no progress. So that's where that's the little trick in our law is that no progress. Progress is very subjective. So as long as mom and baby are okay, it really depends individually on each situation. How long past 40 weeks do you allow your clients to finish? So I, according to our law for home births, um, we have to send you for a consultation in between 41 and 42 weeks. The standard of care in the OB world is that that monitoring starts right at 41. So I let clients know, this is the standard of care, 41 weeks. My law says this and this. You can choose what works for you within that time frame. Some people want the extra monitoring at 41 weeks, and that's okay. We send you right at 41. Some people want to push it until 41 and 6 because they don't want to go and deal with the hospital if they don't have to. So, um, so as long as they go by 42, by 41 and 6, like in the evening, then those are clinically significant. What they typically do is the, the assessment by the OB, uh, non-stress test, sometimes a biophysical profile, which is an ultrasound to kind of look at baby. Mm -hmm. Those are clinically significant for three days. So if you don't have a baby within three days, we send you back to the hospital for another one, and so on and so forth. The longest I've ever had a mom go was 46 weeks. Um, and that was with the blessing of she had an OB that um, she was had a relationship with. So, and he just saw her every few days at the, his office, and everything was fine, and so. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs>